All right, so um, I'm going to be doing a, uh, a series, uh, two, two sermon series, uh, just before Easter, which is two Sundays before we have uh, Good Friday and Easter, and sort of to do with the Easter's theme uh, as it deals with Isaiah. So we're going to be looking at Isaiah 53, 1 to 6 this morning, and uh, let's, uh, let's read that first and let's get into it. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the Lord been revealed, the arm of the Lord been revealed. He grew up before him like a tender shoot, uh, like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised. And we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But no, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. In two weeks, uh, we will be remem remembering the death of Christ at, at the Good Friday service on April the 7th, 10 a.m. at Bethel, uh, Bethel Church, Caribou Bethel Church. And that's all the churches in, in, in Williams Lake will be gathering there. Then on Sunday, April the 9th, we will be remembering the resurrection of Christ at our Easter Friendship Sunday service, along with baptism, which is really cool. Uh, looking forward to that. Now, the death and resurrection of Christ are the most important events that have ever happened in the history of the world, without question. There will never be any more events important than those, more important than those. It is the focus theme, these are the focus theme of the New Testament, and it's even the ultimate theme of the Old Testament. The next two Sundays, I would like to prepare our hearts uh, for these special memories by doing a two-part sermon series from the Old Testament in Isaiah 53. Most of us, I think, are familiar with that wonderful chapter. Uh, for Christians, Isaiah 53 is the most powerful and most popular chapter in the Old Testament. At least the New Testament writers saw it that way. It is the most quoted chapter from the Old Testament, in the New Testament, uh, of any other uh, passage in the Old Testament. The New Testament apostles believed that Isaiah 53 clearly explained the core message of the Christian gospel. Now Isaiah was written 700 years before Jesus came. So to predict the death and resurrection of Christ in such detail, of course, is a miracle. And it demonstrates, again, that the Bible is indeed the Word of God. So today I want to look at the first six verses of Isaiah 53 that primarily focus, primarily focus on the death of Christ. And next week, next week, we will look at the last six verses that primarily focus on the resurrection of Christ. The description of Christ in Isaiah 53 actually starts at the end of Isaiah 52. There's the last three verses of Isaiah 52 sort of introduce uh, Isaiah 53. Uh, and he's called there my servant. Isaiah 52, 13 says, See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. And then it goes on to describe the whole death and resurrection uh, of the Messiah. So this is the uh, uh, last, uh, this, these servant passages, there's four of them uh, uh, in, in Isaiah. They're also found in Isaiah 42, 49, and 50. And there's no doubt that this servant is the promised Messiah. Are you sure this is talking about the Messiah? Yes, it is, uh, in, in many ways. He is described as a humble man who will minister to hurting people. And then he is described as God's king who will bring salvation to the entire world. And all rulers will be in subjection 
to him. That is a, by definition is what the Messiah is and will be. So I, we find that in, for example, Isaiah 49, 6 to 7, where it talks about the servant. He says, I will also make you a light for the Gentiles. That means all the nations of the world. That my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Kings will see you and stand up. Whoa, here's, here's the Messiah. Princes will see and bow down and worship, as it were. Because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. Now our world is in trouble and we can't fix ourselves. Have you come to that conclusion yet? Our world's in trouble, can't fix How many thousands of years will it take before we can honestly come to that conclusion? So, the Messiah will have to come to save us from ourselves, right? We need a Savior and He is the one who will bring salvation to the very ends of of the earth. So now we come to Isaiah 53. And this chapter describes what the Jewish servant Messiah must do in order to bring about salvation to the entire world. He says you're going to bring salvation. What's that mean? Deliverance. What's it mean? And what he will do is actually somewhat shocking. And most of the world will not believe it when it happens. And the vast majority indeed will reject him when he comes. That's what Isaiah 53, 1 begins by telling us. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? I mean, the idea is this. This is unbelievable. And not many people will believe it. The only ones who will believe it are those who have had the arm of the Lord revealed to them. The arm of the Lord is another name for God and describes him as a powerful God with a strong arm to save us. And it's just mentioned actually a few verses earlier in Isaiah 52 verse 10. It says this, the Lord will lay bare his holy arm. He's going to roll up his sleeves. I can't roll up my sleeves. I don't have any muscles anyhow, so that's no big deal, right? The Lord will lay bare his holy arm. He's got lots of muscles, eh? In the sight of all the nations. And all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. Again, this is talking about the, the coming Messiah who will rule as king over the uh, world. And he's coming to save us. That's what he's doing. Now, uh, how many of you know about Mighty Mouse? Have you ever know about Mighty Mouse? So, I know some of the older folks. I no, I'm sorry. Well, no, some of you younger folks may not know about Mighty Mouse. But anyhow, uh, Mighty Mouse was one of my heroes when I was a boy, not many years ago, many decades ago. And in every cartoon show, he would flex the muscles in his arm and call out, here I come to save the day, right? And then the background singers would say, you know that Mighty Mouse is on his way. No, you haven't heard that? <laughs> And then he would miraculously fly down and rescue a mouse maiden in distress who was being held captive by an evil cat. He would beat the cat up, boom, 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 and save the mouse damsel from her captivity. I guess the old cartoons are too violent for today's children, wouldn't you agree? But you know, that's not the way that God is going to powerfully save us. Just the opposite. Instead of beating someone up to save us, he is going to allow us to beat him up to save us. Isn't that different? To us, this is not a sign of power. I mean, naturally speaking, it's a sign of weakness. Who ever heard of such foolishness? <laughs> Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.18, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Isaiah 53 begins by saying, Who has believed our message? And that's why Paul quotes Isaiah 53, 1, you know, uh, 700 years later when he's uh, talking about the gospel. He says, But not all Israelites will accept the good news. For Isaiah said, and he quotes Isaiah 53, 1, Lord, who has believed our message? It's unbelievable. And even when Jesus did miracles during his ministry, many of the Jewish people that were around him rejected him, even though he was there in Messiah. For example, John 12, 37 to 38 says this, even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, he did a lot of miracles, right? They still would not believe in him. 
This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, Isaiah 51, 53, 1, quote, word for word, Lord, who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He just is unbelievable. Predicted that it would be unbelievable, and most would reject, and that is exactly what happened. Now, even uh, 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 Christ's closest disciples, he had the 12 disciples with him during his ministry on earth, right? Even his followers, his closest followers, did not believe that the Messiah Jesus was going to die for their sins. They were totally shocked when it happened. They thought he was going to powerfully set up God's kingdom on earth. That's what the king's supposed to do, right? And that's why after his death, they were totally disillusioned. It was only after his resurrection that he was able to appear to them and explain to them all the Old Testament scriptures that talked about his death and resurrection before he went into glory. Luke 24, 25, just 27, he's talking to a couple of them. He said to them, how foolish you are, how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And he'd look at this, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, including Isaiah 53, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Wouldn't you like to have been in that Bible study? The hardcore gospel that we're going to be talking about this morning is very hard for us to believe by nature. Who has believed our message? Okay, as we move to verse 2, we see this coming servant Messiah described as a boy growing up. It says he, threw, he grew up before him, before God, he grew up before God like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. A shoot and a root, sounds like Canadian out and about, eh? A shoot and a root are also descriptive words of the coming Messiah who is described in Isaiah 11. Quote, Isaiah 11, 1 and 10, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, from his roots. A branch will bear fruit. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. That means all the peoples. The nations will rally to him, and his resting place will be glorious. This is the Messiah. No doubt about it. Anyhow, just to exp explain what that uh, Isaiah 11 is talking about there, as far as the the, brand, uh, the, uh, the stump, etc. Jesse was the name of King David's father, okay? And it was from King David's descendants that the Messiah King was promised to come. But King David's official dynasty ended when the Babylonians took Israel into captivity in 600 BC. They, 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 they wiped out all the kings and that was it, no more. Since then, there have been no more Jewish kings. It was like the tree of David's dynasty was cut down and all that remained was a stump. Everyone thought David's dynasty of kings was dead. And yet 600 years later, 600 years later, a physical descendant from that stump sprouted out like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground, like who would have thought, eh? That's, you know, and, and David's dynasty came back to life when Christ was born. The promised Messiah King had indeed come out of that stump. <laughs> so this promised servant in Isaiah is called that tender shoot and root out of dry ground. Now, the Messiah King in Christ was the most important and powerful human being ever born. He was both God and man, right? And yet we are told he would be, he would be quite an ordinary looking chap when he's growing up. There would be nothing outwardly that would attract us to him. So it says Isaiah 53, 2, he grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. You'd look at him and say, well, okay, well, there's an average Joe, whatever, you know. And uh, here's an even greater shock. Well, let me, let me go back here first. And so it was that the Messiah King, God in the flesh, was born to a young, obscure couple, right? Who were very poor and needy, Joseph and Mary. Nothing special about them. Poor, poor people. He was born in a barn with animals. Yikes. Because there was no room for him in the end. Rejection. When he was born, even. He grew up as an obscure, hard-working carpenter until he began his ministry at the age of 30. 
He was nothing special from our point of view. Just an average looking, hard working guy, barely making ends meet. And then there's even this greater shock. I get ahead of my, I was getting ahead of myself there. This even greater shock that doesn't even make any sense to us at all. It's one surprise and one shock after the other as you read this through this chapter. Uh, totally unexpected. He was despised. Not only nothing special about him, but he was despised and rejected by all mankind and experienced great suffering and pain in the process. Now, other scriptures in the Old Testament describing the Messiah said he was going to be the king who would rule over all the world. Everyone was expecting a powerful king to overthrow all the evil governments of the world. But instead, this is what it now says in Isaiah 53.3. He was despised and rejected by mankind. Not only the Jewish people, but all of mankind. A man of suffering and familiar with pain like one whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Like this is, ugh, despised. Who cares? Who cares? When Jesus was on earth, he was quite humble and was not trying to gain political power, right? He wasn't trying to overthrow the government of Rome. For that reason, people began doubting that he was the true Messiah. But Jesus said, hey, you guys are only looking at the predictions of the Messiah that you like to see, the, you know, the big powerful ones, right? What about predictions like this? And then he pointed them to Isaiah 53.3. This is Jesus himself quoting from Isaiah 53.3. Why then, he says to the people, is it written, in Isaiah 53.3, that the Son of Man must suffer and be rejected? What about that? But why would the powerful King of Kings experience rejection pain, and suffering. We are about to find out as we move into verse 4. Bingo, verse 4, 53, of Isaiah. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. <laughs> Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. This verse starts out by using uh, uh, the word surely, right? That comes from a Hebrew word which means unexpectedly. Like, why? I didn't expect that. It is saying, what I'm about to say is totally unexpected. Unexpectedly, the reason he is experiencing pain and sorrow is because he will take up our pain and our suffering. Really, it wasn't his pain and suffering that he experienced. It was ours. The words took up. Do you see that word took up? There are two words took up. The words took up are the same Hebrew words used in Leviticus 16, where on the Day of Atonement, the sins of the nation of Israel were transferred onto a goat sacrifice. Look at that. There's a picture of a goat. If it doesn't look like a goat, it is. And here the priest is placing his hands on top of the goat, and is symbolic of, of placing all the sins of the entire nation of Israel onto this animal. It says, he, the priest, is to lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites and all their sins and put them on the goat's head. The goat will carry on itself. And that's that word take up. That same word in Isaiah 53 where it says he will take up, it's the same word used here. The goat will take up all their sins to a remote place. He's going to take them away. Hallelujah, right? Now when all the sins of Israel were transferred onto that goat, the goat took up their sins and carried them to a remote place. Now we get the word, have you heard the word scapegoat? You've heard that phrase, scapegoat? This is where, you look at any dictionary, this is, how you, these, this is where it comes from, these, these verses in Leviticus. The dictionary.com definition of scapegoat is a person, quote, a person or group made to bear the blame for others or to suffer in their place. Exactly. The Messiah was our scapegoat. All this was symbolic of the coming Messiah and our coming salvation. He took the fall for us. Now both Peter and Matthew quote this verse, Isaiah 53, 4, or portions of it, and I'll just take, give you that just for the, for the fun of it. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. He's pointing back to this, this verse. Also in Matthew. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up, there they are again, he took up our infirmities and bore our diseases, all pointing back to this verse. 
Now the rest of verse 4 says this, Yet we considered him punished by God, and stricken by him, and afflicted. When Jesus suffered on the cross, the entire crowd who witnessed it, what did they do? They scorned him, right? They scorned him. And poked fun at him. They started poking, you can just read through it in the Gospels yourself. He's getting what he deserved. He was a pretend Messiah who spoke blasphemy. He did not set up God's kingdom on earth. He's just receiving his just punishment from God. But verse 5 goes on to emphasize again. No, it wasn't for his sins that he was pierced and crushed. Verse 5 says this, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. I'm trying to emphasize it just in case you're forgetting the first time, right? Yes, the Messiah was receiving punishment, but not for him, but from God. But he was not being punished for his sins. He was being punished for our sins that had been laid on him. And since he took our punishment from God, we no longer, we no longer need to be punished. Is that good news or what? That has given us peace with God and healing for our souls. And that's what verse 5 goes on to say. Here's the rest of that verse. But he was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. This verse clearly says that the Messiah will receive the punishment for our sins in our place so that we will not have to receive it. This is the only way we can experience peace with God and deep healing within. The theological term for that is penal substitution, just in case you were wondering. Most of the world today, including, listen to this, including an increasing number of Bible-believing evangelical pastors, do not believe that God was punishing Jesus for our sins on the cross. And that's a fact. They think, well, it's not a very loving thing for God to do something like that. Amazingly, they can't see how much, how God punishing, God was punishing Jesus, but Jesus is also God, right? Part of, if they don't believe in the Trinity, that's another thing. But if you believe in the Trinity, then Jesus was God. So God was punishing himself for us. He, as the creator of all things, the creator of the world that became corrupt through Adam and Eve, he said, all right, uh, you guys are running, you know, this is, uh, this is not good, eh? You rebelled against me. This is not good. We need, justice needs to be done. But I'll tell you what, I'm not going to wipe you out. I'll tell you what, I'll become a man, and, and I will take all my wrath and punishment against the entire creation. I'll just take it myself on the cross. Wow! They can't see how God punishing himself for us is the greatest act of love this world will ever see. Listen, there are many wonderful things that we experience because Jesus died on the cross for us, including a clear conscience, right? Eternal life, that's pretty cool. Becoming a child of God, sounds nice. And experiencing love, joy, and peace. That's all because of what Jesus has done. But the only reason we can enjoy these things is because we've been delivered from the judgment of God. When Jesus took our sins, he also took our punishment. God poured out his wrath on himself <laughs> so that we could be saved from it. God, through Christ, laid down his life for us, for his own creation, to save it. And we read in Romans 5, verse 9, since we have been justified, that means declared righteous, once, once, God, once Christ took our punishment, boom! We've been, he took our sins and our punishment, boom! God says, I declare you righteous now. We've been declared righteous by his blood. He's shed blood on the cross. How much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Of course, it's done. It's over. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 1 10 says, uh, Paul says, and we are to wait from his, for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. You see, the wrath of God is like the judgment day at the end of all history. Right? Someday Christ is going to return, and it's going to be like judgment day. But for us who have put our faith in the sacrifice of Jesus, he rescues us from the coming wrath. Why? Because he took it for us already. 1 Thessalonians 5 9, for God did not appoint us to suffer wrath. No. 
but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. All right. So, in order to accept Christ as our substitute, however, you know, you have to make a personal decision. God doesn't force anything on you. That will require us to swallow our pride and put our faith in the substitute sacrifice of Jesus in order to have peace with our Creator God. In one sense, it's pretty easy, right? Swallow our pride. That should be easy. Or <laughs> well, maybe it's not easy. <laughs> swallow our pride. And... Uh, put our faith. Now, this is hard to believe. This is all stuff. This is pretty hard stuff to believe. Really? Jesus did that? God did that? If you put your faith, you know, why does God require that? Why does it why require that we humble ourselves and put our faith in his incredible sacrificial love? Why? Because that's the only thing that's going to change our hearts. He's after our hearts, not our activities. Okay, is that good enough, God? Are you happy now? No, he's after our hearts. He wants to win our hearts. It's a relationship, a love relationship. That's what Christianity is all about. A love relationship. He wants our hearts. So, uh, yeah, we have to swallow our pride, faith in a substitute sacrifice, in order to have peace with God, our Creator. The deepest human needs, look at the deepest human needs, whether we realize it or not, people out there are going around, who cares about Christianity, right? Who cares about God? I'm just doing my thing here. But the deepest human needs are... First of all, peace with God, which results in peace within, which results in peace with others. But true and lasting peace always starts with God. Why does it always start with God? Because, because human beings are spirit beings. We're not just, you know, a body and, and uh, mind, emotion, and will. No, no we're, we're spirit beings. We were created in the image of God. Genesis 1, right? And we are the only beings in the universe, including angels, that were created from the breath or spirit of God. Genesis 2, 7 says God breathed his spirit. The, the, the Hebrew is, is the same for breath and spirit, same word. He breathed on us, breath of life. And he doesn't do that for any other creation. Just us, just human beings. The breath of life of God. That's the spirit. God is spirit, right? It says God is spirit. That says we're told that in scripture. He breathed, he breathed that spirit life into Adam and Eve. Boom! And they became alive. So we are the only created beings that are capable of having intimate communion with God, spirit to spirit. Animals can't do that. Angels can't do that. Sometimes we think angels are more powerful and significant than we are. We're not. They're way below us. Did you know that? They're way below us. They're not in the image of God. They don't have the life of God breathed into them. They are not spirit beings in that sense. All right. So, the ultimate source of all our guilt, shame, and insecurity. And by the way, wouldn't you agree? I mean, most psychologists say this now. That the primary problem that human beings have is a sense of inferiority and shame and insecurity. I think you know that, don't you? I mean, it's pretty, pretty much evident, really. So what we're saying is the ultimate source, the ultimate source of all that guilt, shame, and insecurity is the inner sense that we are not at one with God and that he's not pleased with us. You can be an atheist and whatever, but deep down, that's what's going on in your spirit. All the rest of our insecurities flow from that. So we can never achieve deep peace in our lives unless we are first at peace with God. And the essence of the gospel is guilt-free, shame-free, and fear-free living for all eternity, and that is good news. Therefore, we're told in Romans 5, 1, therefore, since we have been justified, declared righteous, through faith, just trusting God, right? Humbly trusting God, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Finally, we're into the last verse now. Coming around the bend, coming in. Finally, Isaiah 53, 6, then describes what the source and essence of our sin is. What's the, what's, the, what's the main thing about our sin? Again, surprisingly, surprise, surprise, everything is a surprise in Isaiah 53. Surprise! Sin is not primarily uh, about doing bad things. That's what we think. Sin is doing bad things. That's not primarily what sin is, according to this verse. I mean, do bad things uh, does count for sin, but that's not our main problem. Our main problem is simply 
turning from God and going our own way. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The most serious sin we are all guilty of is rebellion against God, or we might call that high treason against the King of Kings, our Creator. It is refusing to trust God and entrust our lives to God. It doesn't matter, listen, it doesn't matter how nice we are. The question is, are we going our own way and living by our own goodness instead of living in dependence and being at one with God? That's the big question. The essence of all other religions in the world is about moral living. It's about trying to be a good human being. It didn't, and not be a religion or whatever, whatever philosophy in, in life. That's why it is so offensive to people when we tell them our good lives are not good enough for God. God wants us to trust Him and love Him, not impress Him. The world is full of good people, but there are very few who trust and love God because of the sacrifice of Jesus. There's no better way for God to regain our trust than by becoming a human being, take our rebellion upon himself, and then die in our place so that we can have peace with him. If we can't trust God after seeing that, we'll never trust God. That, and what else can he do, right? That's the ultimate. 1 John 4, 10 and 19 says, This is love. Not that we love God, no, no. But that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning, his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. We love because he first loved us. This morning, we have looked at the dark side of Easter, if you will, as we have reflected on the death of Christ in Isaiah 53, 1 to 6. But next week, good news is coming here. Well, this is all good news too, right? Next week, we'll look at the, um, the lighter or the brighter side of Easter as we rejoice in the resurrection of Christ in Isaiah 53, 7 to 12, the last six verses of Isaiah 53. Now that will be the final victory for Christ and for us. But darkness must always come before the dawn and that's what we looked at this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the fact that the, your word is, um, you know, we say it's the word of God. Well, it's obviously the word of God. Who in the world could predict these things 700 years before they did precisely and have it unravel exactly what you say? Who could do that? Only God who knows the beginning to the end. So yes, we thank you for the word of God, the Bible. It's a supernatural book. We praise you for it. And we thank you for the sacrifice you made we believe in the Father, Son, and the Spirit is, is God. And you sent your only Son to die for our sins in our place so that we can have peace with you. And a whole lot of good stuff we're going to talk about next week too. You're so good to us, Lord. Uh, help us to believe it <laughs> and trust it and to keep on praising you for eternity. And if anyone here has never accepted Jesus Christ as their sacrifice, as their Lord, and just yielded their heart to him. Well, maybe they could even do that right now. Right where they're sitting, just say, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry. Please come into my life. I need you for your forgiveness. Thank you for being such a wonderful, loving God. I entrust myself to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.